Thank you, Dr. Berger. Uh, and thank you to the IBS for this session today. Uh, so I'll be talking today again on the topic of living well and aging well with HIV. So this week actually marks uh, 40 years of the HIV epidemic. And over that time, 35 million people have died of HIV. And there are now 37 million persons living with HIV worldwide today. Over the last decade Sorry, and Manny, a half- have, have you started sharing a screen by any chance? Oh, I think that's probably the... <laughs> Thank you for that. Are we good? Brilliant. Yep. Can see okay, it. Thank great. you. Okay. Perfect. So uh, again, sorry, this week, again, marks 40 years of the HIV epidemic. And over that time, uh, there've been 35 million people who've died of HIV. And there are now 37 million persons living with HIV worldwide today. And really over the last decade and a half, uh, the number of HIV infected adults receiving HIV medications has increased substantively through global cooperative efforts uh, from approximately, as you see here, 700,000 in 2000 to over 15 million by mid 2015. Now with access to effective HIV medications, uh, HIV infected persons are living longer and the age demographic of the HIV infected population is shifting and the number of older HIV infected adults, namely those 50 years and older, is actually expected to triple to 12 million by 2040. These trends have been happening here in the US for some time, and it's estimated that over 50% of those living with HIV in the US are now 50 years and older. Additionally, one in six new HIV diagnoses now occur among persons 50 years and older as well. So now, despite the tremendous gains in survival for persons living with HIV, gaps in death rates between HIV infected and HIV uninfected adults still remain. This is data here from the Kaiser Permanente California cohort with death rates for those living with HIV in red and those without HIV in blue. Whereas one can see here that death rates for those with HIV have actually dramatically declined with time, at the end of the study period, they actually remained a 13 year gap in survival between those with HIV and those without. These survival gaps have been most severe for certain racial ethnic groups and for persons with a history of injection drug use. This is data from the North American Accord, a collaboration of HIV cohort studies across the US and Canada, showing life expectancy from age 20 for persons with HIV by race and transmission group. And one can see the lowest survival for non-white groups living with HIV on the left and for persons with a history of injection drug use in green on the right. These findings actually parallel the persistent disproportionate burden of HIV among certain racial ethnic groups in the US, among groups with higher socioeconomic challenge and among persons with a history of injection drug use. For instance, US blacks constitute 13% of the general population, yet 42% of new HIV infections and about 40% of persons living with HIV. There also has been a higher burden of HIV among those with lower income lower educational attainment and lower employment. And approximately 16% of persons living with HIV in the US had HIV attributed to a history of injection drug use. So why do disparities in survival still exist for HIV infected versus uninfected adults when we now have highly effective HIV medications to suppress the virus? Well, first, despite tremendous gains in HIV medication access, we still have some way to go relative to access, with 73% of persons with HIV worldwide on effective HIV medication as of 2020. But this means another 27% of those living with HIV actually not on life-saving HIV medication treatment. Additionally, even as HIV infected persons are living longer with effective HIV medications, HIV infected persons at the same time are now being observed to have more heart attacks, more strokes, more kidney disease, more liver disease, more lung disease, more bone disease, and more cancer, among other conditions. In effect, overall, a higher burden of aging-related disease and aging-related syndromes, which takes us to the concept of frailty as a potential critical aging-related target to reduce the notable disparities that we still see in adverse outcomes for those living with HIV compared to those without HIV. So what is frailty? Frailty is a syndrome of vulnerability to adverse health outcomes such as death, hospitalization, and disability. 
It's considered biologically to reflect a decreased resilience or ability to bounce back after one is hit with an internal or external stressor. In our current context, one can think about this in the face of a stressor such as COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus, for which those who are older and those with underlying chronic disease conditions have been most vulnerable to severe outcomes. Further frailty is considered to reflect a decline in our body's biological reserves across multiple systems over time. And whereas frailty is aging related, it's not the same as how old you are as we all age in heterogeneous ways. Now we all probably have a picture in our mind of what a frail individual might look like. Just for illustration here, this is former president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, an inspiration for us in the field of HIV in terms of his advocacy and an inspiration far beyond. And on the left is President Mandela in his younger years. He's quite robust with strong muscle mass. As he gets older, in the middle, he loses some muscle mass, but he's still quite vigorous. And the picture on the far right is President Mandela not too long before his death. He's much more gaunt with significant loss of muscle, and is re he's reliant on his wife, Graca Michelle, here to move around. So beyond appearance, frailty has been codified in the scientific literature in specific ways. This is one primary framework here defined by Linda Fried and colleagues here at Hopkins in which frailty can be considered as an aberrant cycle of dysregulated energy expenditure, muscle quality and mass that manifests itself in the form of weight loss, weakness, exhaustion, slow gait speed or decreased mobility and low physical activity. And meeting three or more of these criteria classifies someone as being frail. So using this definition, we and others have been examining frailty as a putative target to reduce vulnerability and disparity among persons aging with HIV. This has included work in the AIDS linked to the intravenous experience cohort, a Baltimore community-based cohort of persons with and without HIV. And we and others have found persons living with HIV to be significantly more likely to be frail than those without HIV. Those with HIV are 66% more likely to be frail in our studies. And we and others have also found that those who are frail were more likely to be hospitalized and more likely to die than those who are not frail. In our work, being frail, one is three times more likely to die than not being frail. And further compared to those who are neither HIV infected nor frail, if you both had HIV and were frail, you were seven times more likely to die. So in addition to hospitalization and death, other studies in HIV have found frailty to be significantly associated with other bad outcomes, including falls, fractures, disability, and overall decreased quality of life. Which brings us to understanding what leads to frailty in HIV is appreciably key to informing interventions to ensure that those living with HIV live long and live well. So we and others have found that the pathways associated with increased progression to frailty include increased age, socioeconomic challenge, including low educational attainment, low income and unemployment, poorly controlled HIV infection, and having an increased number or burden of chronic comorbid disease conditions, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, kidney disease, and obesity. Finally, beyond these factors, understanding basic biological pathways to frailty could additionally inform development of therapeutics to prevent or ameliorate frailty in HIV. And heightened inflammation, which we know to be central to HIV pathophysiology, we found that heightened inflammation, even among those with well-controlled HIV, is predictive of a range of adverse outcomes in HIV, including as shown in this figure here, decreased survival, the highest total having of inflammation having the lowest level of survival. And we and others similarly have found that increased inflammation is strongly associated with frailty in HIV. So in sum, if we are to target frailty to ensure that those living with HIV live long and live well, we must work harder as we have needed to do from the early days of the epidemic to continue to improve access to HIV treatment and care, pursue early and consistent HIV medication therapy to ensure effective control of the HIV virus and prevent progression to AIDS, which we've found to precipitate frailty, prevent or reduce chronic comorbid disease conditions among those living with HIV, reduce chronic inflammation, even for those who have achieved good control of the HIV virus on effective medication therapy, and address the social determinants of health. Just finally on this last point, health equity has been defined by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine as the state in which everyone has the opportunity to attain their full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or any other socially defined circumstance. As we move forward, we have the definitive obligation to strive to achieve health equity for those living with HIV 
as we push to ensure that those living with HIV live long and live well. So I'd just like to thank our research participants, our research team, and all our collaborators and all our funders for this and related work. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, many thanks, Damani. Um, so again, just to remind the, the participants, feel free to put any questions you might have into the Q&A. Um, that's one of the little buttons usually at the bottom of your sort of Zoom screen. Um, I'll lead it off. I'm just curious, for starters, uh, what do you what do you think your discoveries that you've made concerning the link between frailty and HIV mean for intervention and treatment? I mean, what if, if you have a vision for how you might sort of use your findings practically? You know, what what would that vision be? Sure. So I think uh, one component is uh, definitely lots of work going on in terms of thinking about precursor inflammatory pathways, uh, things such as the gut microbiome, uh, mitochondrial pathways, uh, uh, epigenetics, uh, a range of, of upstream uh, biological determinants uh, that uh, we hope uh, through things such as probiotics, prebiotics, other things such as that one might be able to consider intervening upon. Uh, and then uh, I think uh, there is uh, clearly the whole comorbidity axis uh, and uh, the biology thereof of stress systems and so forth as well. Uh, and then finally, the psychosocial uh, uh, environmental piece uh, in terms of what are we going to do from a policy perspective in terms of addressing uh, social stresses that might convert to biological stress that might convert to inflammation, frailty, uh, and hospitalization and death. And so intervening on those pathways as well. Uh -huh. so, so sort of building off that a little bit then, um, you know, you're thinking in terms of therapies, uh, one question is, you know, what kind of improvements are needed or necessary to improve access to anti-HIV medicines? Yeah, sure. So I think we've, we've, we've definitely had uh, clearly substantial exponential growth uh, since 2000, right, in terms of access overall. Um, I think some of that has come through uh, institutional government to government uh, and other investments that the PEPFAR program, for example, has been uh, substantively helpful uh, in that regard uh, in terms of access. Um, but I think we, we still have, uh, there are multiple steps along that cascade of care. Uh, folks, need, folks need to know that they uh, actually have HIV, right? So what is the step down from being infected to being diagnosed? Uh, going from being diagnosed to actually being linked to care and linked to uh, uh, physicians and so forth, to staying in care, uh, to getting on uh, antiretroviral therapy and HIV meds, uh, and to uh, staying suppressed. And ultimately, I think as Dr. Blankson uh, discussed maybe earlier on, an HIV cure uh, from a biological frame is definitively a, a substantive goal for all of us in the HIV community. So, so building a little off that, you were referring back to one of the earlier talks that we had today. Um, so, uh, you know, as a, as a sort of tie into another talk that we heard earlier, are there any links between the types of anti-HIV therapies that individuals receive and their likelihood of developing frailty? Yeah, so that's another era for, for further uh, uh, assessment. Um, so when we think about why folks have in with HIV have a higher burden of uh, HIV associated or aging phenotypes. And there really have been sort of four domains that come into play. One is co-infection. So thinking about hepatitis C, for example, and liver disease. One is thinking about considerations around uh, factors that uh, such as tobacco use, um, which uh, tend to be of higher burden, for example, in our uh, folks living with HIV as, uh, compared to other communities. Uh, definitely medication has been something that folks have looked at, right, uh, as it was a focus of a lot of work uh, over the last, I would say, two decades ago. Uh, I think that we've gotten much better meds now. I mean, clearly there are meds that affect bones, such as tenofovir, and uh, I was thinking about bone density. Uh, there could be m uh, meds that have affected muscle in the past as well. I think uh, generally the, the consideration is that being on meds is definitively better than not being on meds, regardless of what that medication is. Uh, so uh, that, that's definitely a movement that we've had. But I do think the axis for us right now is drilling down on the biology of HIV and how the biology of HIV intersects with the biology of frailty 
and how that will inform interventions um, that probably will apply both to HIV. That HIV biology could probably inform frailty biology for non-HIV as well, I, I would anticipate. Okay, so two more questions. One is from Peter Weiss. Um, the vulnerability of aging people with HIV sounds so perilous that it makes me wonder, are there problems with HIV infected people getting access to health insurance? Yeah, um, so, so definitely there is lots of intersection between uh, the considerations of access to, to health care for HIV and access to health care more broadly. Uh, definitely we've had uh, things such as Ryan White in the US, right, that have uh, definitely drilled down on in, uh, advancing uh, health insurance access uh, for folks here in the US, uh, although uh, that still ties into all the things that we need to do to ensure access to care more broadly for people in the US. Uh, I think I, I would expand that globally to think about what is our access to uh, payment for health uh, in our global space as well, that I think we, we, we uh, is a complex field, but that we need to continue to address as well. And, and it's different in different spaces. Okay, thank you. And then the last question is from Barbara Youngworth, who asks, could the higher incarceration rates among black men compared to white people and the poor healthcare, food, et cetera, in jail and prison explain some of the racial differences you see in frailty? Yeah, so that's a, uh, so definitely there is a intersection of uh, populations that have impacted by incarceration uh, and populations that are impacted by HIV. And there are a lot of folks who have invested a lot of work in terms of HIV and Hep C alike uh, for that population as well. Um, uh, I think there, there is some, uh, the question of latency of that effect as to how long it's going to be from, uh, 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 how long it will take um, for, to see that impact uh, on frailty from someone who is in a situation where there is incarceration and sort of the confounding factors of, again, socioeconomics, um, aging, HIV, hep C. Uh, I think it's teasing those kinds of things out as well, but access to care, right? And, and linkage to care, <laughs> maintaining biologic suppression, all of the factors, social determinant factors, I think intersect with the incarceration factors that can, can, can likely uh, potentially precipitate challenges in terms of frailty. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much again, Damani.